We're here with Walt Cox. He's an expert on product, payments, and fintech partnerships. Uh, in his current role as head of partner banking, focusing on uh, scaled companies and delivering money movement cases. Uh, previously worked in early stage fintech uh, in business development and technical product uh, management roles. Uh, today, we'll learn uh, about a digital payment system built for cannabis retail and how this can lower risk and empower any pioneering business. As developers, we want to build and grow, um, and that can be stunted in high-risk markets. Uh, for example, video game, metaverse credits, uh, gold and silver, uh, marketplaces, cannabis, uh, maybe even uh, crypto. Uh, so we'll learn Walt's insight on his success and leveraging technology to enable digital wallet payments. Uh, so I'm going to just pass it over to Walt. Thanks for being here, Walt. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so we're going to jump in. I've got a couple things to share. So let's start at the beginning. Why did we do all this? So I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see it. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Valley Bank is a uh, top 30 financial institution by way of assets. Uh, we currently support uh, many of the largest uh, multi-state operators in the cannabis space. We've been working in cannabis uh, here, gosh, going on two and a half years and uh, have uh, you know, just over 27 state programs. Um, as I was brought on about a year and a half ago, there were multiple kind of discussions going at the time of, should we buy or build a payment service to help our customers ultimately uh, at the point of sale because cannabis remains federally illegal, uh, the card networks do not support it today. And so I spent some time with our customers, uh, with, uh, give you, give you this slide, spent some time with our customers back here with our team, both serving them as well as, uh, many kind of folks in the industry, whether it's on the compliance side, the payment side, and, uh, really came together with, uh, our customers to build kind of a, uh, a minimal viable product really built around the idea of moving a cash transaction into a digital wallet that could be hosted and delivered by Valley. Um, so we anchored around this idea, and I'll go back to this slide, that uh, we could out of the box provide a uh, legally compliant, regulatory approved uh, ability to move funds from a user who had signed up for this wallet uh, to effectively grab those funds in the state that has approved either retail or medical cannabis use we would hold those funds on behalf of that user, which then could be redeemed at the store that banks at Valley. So that is, in essence, a closed loop model where you have, whether it's the merchant on one side and the user on the other, both effectively are being banked by the same entity, thus allowing funds to move between those entities, not moving on uh, you know, a, network of, uh, a network of many different um, kind of folks participating. So... That's the closed loop side of it. Uh, we stood up a team. So uh, myself, we had another fantastic uh, product manager. We built a, a small, uh, I'd say about a dozen folks. Uh, and I'm going to flip just for a second. I know I'm talking to developers. So I'm going to put my very, very small technical hat on. Uh, you know, we ran an agile two-week sprint uh, scrum. We had a scrum dedicated scrum master, dozen folks, uh, including our own kind of QA function alongside of the developers themselves. Uh, so we were kind of rapidly iterating. You're seeing an Azure DevOps board right now. We, we, we're not using Jira, uh, much to my uh, dismay. I love Jira and some of the Confluence tools. Azure, ADO worked just fine. At the end of the day, uh, we developed this really great kind of working pattern. So in a, in a, you know, in a scrum kind of setting, it's really, really important in my experience, that the developers have direct access to, uh, you know, the the product managers and the product owners, so that you know, as you're doing daily standups, you're kind of keeping the developers unblocked and busy. Um, there's nothing worse than a developer that can't like execute because the requirements are vague or the, the documentation to actually execute, you know, just isn't there. So, uh, so we felt really good about kind of this working team, what we're able to accomplish. Um, you know, we 
went down the path of microservices and had lots of good repos. You know, we built an ACH API to pull the funds in, which we separated from how we were going to load funds onto the stored value uh, to then redeem at the point of sale, which is separate from how we then, of course, support settlement, uh, all, all of those good things. We, we stood up a CI CD pipeline, which I was really excited about, uh, and ultimately got into unit testing. Uh, we have four different environments. We I think we ran over 900 unit mm -hmm. tests. Um, because of the nature of the transaction, it's really important that a user is not only able to create the wallet, fund the wallet, and then, of course, redeem. That settlement function is really important at the end, right? And so we we broke all these pieces down, ran them down through all the sprints, then did all the unit testing, and uh, it really helped us. It helped us dramatically when we went live. So, so we... And I know I'm moving really fast. Apologize if you guys have questions, please jump in. But um, we went from, and I'm going to flip back to this slide just for a second. So we went from the idea and the market research of what we wanted to do. This was September of 2021 to actually having a dedicated team with scope kick off in October of 2021 to going live with a customer at two locations in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we went live April of 2022. So this was like a six month effort that I feel pretty proud of uh, just in what we were able to accomplish in a, in a very short amount of time. Um, so uh, I want to flip over to the demo so you guys actually get a sense of just what the heck I'm talking about. Let me share a slightly different screen here. Just give me one moment. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, while you're doing that, Walt, uh, the Q&A is open, guys, so feel free to pop your questions in there. We did have one. It was just about, will this be recorded? And yes, it will. Um, so, you know, we're going to send this out. We'll post it later. But just so that you're aware, you know, the chat, I think, is disabled, but you can always ask your questions in Q&A or raise your hand. Awesome. Yeah, and I actually just had one question. You know, we may know, we may know uh, you know, compliance concerns with, uh, you know, high-risk industries or ca cannabis, as you were explaining before. Are there any compliance concerns just with closed loop processing uh, in general? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'll just say uh, when you start talking about like account creation, whether it's on like pure fintech, when you look at like users or wallets, all of that comes kind of kind of cascades down from bank regulatory requirements around AML BSA uh, and and specifically CIP, which is. Uh, you know, KYC, of course, know your customer uh, and CIP, I always forget the acronym, but it's basically the model in which you collect and store all that and validate all that data about who the account holder is. So when you go to a, uh, a US financial institution, you'll have about 35 to 40 fields of data you're filling in. It can get shorter if they're using different technologies kind of behind the scenes to pull data in. On the compliance side, with a closed loop, you're banking the merchant and you're banking the user. So arguably your risk is held and kind of sitting behind those two constructs today, like as they exist, meaning a closed loop service is no more riskier than opening accounts for those two entities today. So the question becomes, how well are you uh, kind of providing like money movement services and like thinking about like limits and risk exposure behind those two entities today, just in how the bank services those two sides of the same coin. So closed loop doesn't make it any more risky. In some ways, it makes it less risky because now rather than attaching an account at another financial institution, which is very common in merchant acquiring, you know, I'm a fill in the blank. I need e-commerce checkout. I'm going to go sign up with Shopify or Stripe or whatever, but my merchant account is still held at, you know, the bank down the street, right? So for merchant acquirers, um, there's an expectation that I can keep my account outside of who's doing the processing. For this product, it was the exact opposite. We we actually felt a, a higher degree of safety across our risk and compliance teams because ultimately the money is just moving inside of Valley. So the, the risk and the exposure to Valley went, went down significantly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see uh, kind of what this looks like in this in this demo. Yeah, so so this is uh you know so we went down the path of a of a React uh, enabled uh, set of web services, uh, really really simple. So so we did a lot of work to make sure uh, we were asking as few data elements in the sign up flow as possible. When you go into a cannabis store or you go to sign up for cannabis, the last thing anyone wants in a point of sale transaction is a lengthy sign up flow. <laughs> 
they would much rather take the card out and say, swipe this or dip this and let me get out of here with my product. So we worked really hard to, to get as few details as possible. Uh, now this is supposed to say email, <laughs> my demo, uh, my demo. So first, last mobile and email. We are doing password authentication. I could talk about why we went down the path with username and password, but ultimately for me, the most important parts of these signup flows is the wallet agreement, the end user license agreement, and the privacy policy. The reason I, as a product owner, anchor towards these things, or these are ultimately the constructs that each party in the transaction are held within under state and federal law, right? So for the merchant who don't who doesn't want money transmitter licenses, it's really important that they are agreeing to the ODFI who's curating the terms curating this payment experience, right? I know developers probably don't care a lot about terms and conditions, um, which is fair. But for me, facilitating the whole end-to-end -end process between helping the user understand they are protected, their funds are uh, safeguarded by a large financial institution. This isn't just some fly-by-night app that just showed up all of a sudden. This is actually being held at a very large financial institution to conduct this transaction between you and the merchant that signed up. So uh, we used email and mobile as a way to uh, do some fraud detection, fraud mitigation services. Uh, shout out to Alloy. Like Tommy, it's a great product over at Alloy. So when we link an account, we're using Plaid as a signup flow. We go through the traditional Plaid flow. Uh, what we've done now is been able to say, here is an amount we want to fund the account with. Yeah. We, we've got an external... Uh, of course, we're not signing up for a full DDA at Valley to enable this transaction. We're linking our bank account wherever I bank today as a user. This then becomes a really important function for the merchant. So if you're familiar with payments, uh, many other countries offer real-time payments. Uh, I think it's over 70 today. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. is still slow in their adoption of RTP and then soon FedNow. So to help the merchant and especially help the user be able to transact as they're opening this account, we added a feature to enable uh, real-time funding, right, on behalf of the merchant for this transaction. So we felt pretty excited. Uh, this went live in production when we stood this up with our, uh, yeah, at our first two stores. Um, so what, as a user, what I'm seeing is, you know, my information that I put in, uh, the account that I linked, the total transaction amount that I asked for because I wanted real-time funding, so I could pay today at the point of sale. Now I sign in and it's an extremely simple process. We did multiple rounds of user testing. Um, and what we found over and over again is keeping the QR code upfront simple, just helped help the user kind of jump in and be ready to pay at the point of sale, where of course the QR could be read, scanned, processed uh, and product delivered. Um, and that's it, that's, that's the demo. I mean, of course we can add funds, where we're going to grab an extra 250 this time, you know, I don't need my product today. I'm going to wait. So what I've got is an active balance of hundred and a pending balance of 250. But at the end of the day, I can, I can reach out to the merchant. If I have questions, I can read the FAQs, lots of good question. Like there's lots of good iteration with the, with the merchant to really make sure at the end of the day, this does what it set out to do, which is buy product at the point of sale. So that's it. That's, that's the demo for value pay. I wanted to ask, um, you know, as we may be getting uh, some questions, you know, this is great. Uh, you know, can you use a closed loop, um, you know, payment, something like this at any high risk retail? I mean, you can go just search up high risk retails. We mentioned some of them before. Um, yeah. But can you use this, you know, in other industries? So the answer is yes. Um, so when you start thinking about the model itself, um, there, you know, there's been a lot of companies that have tried to replicate. So, so you know, in our kind of early days, we said we want to be uh, akin to the Starbucks of cannabis, and that's what we tried to model ourselves after. Um, you know, Starbucks has a lot of things going for it that made it successful. It also took ten years to be one in three of their transactions, right? So, so there's an element in payments where people want fast uh wins and it can be hard to kind of hang in there to get to that kind of scale so i'll just say for other industries uh closed loop can be a great option i don't know that it's ever going to be the default payment model right so 
So when you see kind of what's happening in the checkout today, uh, particularly on e-commerce, it's getting crowded with all these options of buy now, pay later, and uh, and all kinds of things are kind of filling up that queue. Like cat, you can now pay with Cash App, you can pay with all these different wallets. Um, I think the closed loop model it like fits very well for merchants who are developing, uh, you know, that that and driving that close association between brand and consumer. So if you, so so it turns out in the cannabis industry, uh, the social media apps uh, frown upon a lot of cannabis marketing, cannabis activity. So in our early days of like user testing and design iterations, we were looking at actually how can you have like a news feed alongside this wallet to help kind of curate what's happening at the brand, what's happening at the store, and like allow people to have this kind of deeper connection between the merchant and the user. We never got that far in development. Uh, we had to stand the product up, get live, get transactions running through it. And so um, so to answer your question, there are other product categories that I think would be harder uh, to kind of win that brand association um, because they're a little bit more uh, commoditized in nature, transactional in nature. Like if I'm going to go buy gold, Am I always going back to the same gold dealer or merchant to kind of win that share of my of my wallet? I'm not sure. And so it really goes back to what's the business case? How are you going to kind of win those consumers to to kind of shift that spend onto this onto this wallet? So nice and cost comparison. Uh, so is the cost per transaction, you know, or processing for you know closed loop or you know e card uh, versus debit or credit card? Uh, you know, which one? So this is a tricky question. So, so the nice thing about um, when I say tricky, I'll say it's subjective. So the nice thing about Visa and MasterCard rates is they're public. You'll find as you work with different merchant acquiring, and depending on where you play in the merchant acquiring stack, you know whether it's you know at a merchant acquire level or uh, Payfac or or you know really pricing becomes a subject of volumes, right? So if you're moving higher volume, you're going to get better deal on however you're structuring to acquire those, those payment transactions. What also matters is the transaction type. So some tra not all transactions are created equal. If I'm taking uh, you know, dental payments or running payments through a parking meter, those are extraordinarily low risk payments. Therefore, the cost to acquire those transactions are gonna be far lower. So to say it differently, in a closed loop model, often whoever is facilitating the closed loop experience has a much uh, stronger negotiating point to to kind of build out margins, right? And so said differently, when you look at how merchant acquiring is done, closed loop follows very closely. The traditional uh, APR plus, uh, you know, some type of transaction fee model. But at the end of the day, if these are ledgers and you're facilitating a ledger transaction in the same environment, one would argue the cost should be far lower, right? And so uh, with scale, that that can absolutely be done. But when a product is early to market and it's and it's starting to build that volume, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be harder to get that that kind of cost efficiency play. But yeah, there's no reason in a closed loop environment. There's no reason uh, you have to charge what the networks charge today. The networks keep those rates; they're public. Uh, I think a closed loop environment has a lot more flexibility to kind of change those cost structures to fit to fit the merchant model. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from one of the attendees. Uh, is the process for entity and individual KYC the same? Uh, how long would that take usually? So it's a good question. They're separate. So just like if you walk into a bank account today and you get, uh, whether you're signing up an account as a user or as an entity, those are two different paths. So as, a, as an entity, uh, at least today in the US, you've got four different kind of corporate structures and depending on how you answer those questions, you're going to move down different paths for how you as part of that entity is getting an account to be served in the segment you operate in for that bank, right? So to say it differently, at Valley Bank, we have an onboarding process because there's many different merchant types in cannabis. Some are retailers, some are growers, some are plant cultivators, some are laboratories. Those are different account types. And so it's a different approval and onboarding process. On the consumer side, which I walked through in the demo, it's far simpler. So those are real-time, that's real-time account creation. It's four attributes, first, last, email, and mobile, boom. And so 
we had hard failures up front. Like if someone's trying to open an account and they're based in uh, Canada, uh, it would fail. Or they're based in any other country outside the US, it would fail. And so we had kind of some hard failures up front. Any email that's you know, not older than, you know, younger than 30 days, it's going to fail, right? You're not going to get passed and it'll go sit in a queue. And that's where we work with the merchant to determine what do we do with this user, right? Because this looks suspicious. On the merchant side, it's a longer process to get live because uh, long story short, each entity that operates in cannabis today is tied to a license. That license is held in the state. You have to understand how that state banks that license, therefore that entity to make sure you're properly due diligence and onboarding them. So that takes longer than real time in the account opening side for the wallet. So it's a good question. Cool. And just uh, passing this question along as it, you know, it's been asked, um, you know, maybe to get this uh, cleared away. What about high risk lists, you know, SDN, is there a possibility that the name can be lifted? Uh, so I think that's specific. It's an interesting just... question. I, I would I would say it slightly differently, right? Which is uh, so because so because of OFAC, OFAC requires sanction screening tied to the Patriot Act. You have to be able to uh, look at kind of first last because now the problem with OFAC is that you get so many false positives. So someone has to literally clear through that because there's a thousand John Smiths in you know this one zip code, right? So so I would say the question differently, which is. Can you identify someone not using first last that still meets OFAC requirements? I'm sure you can. We didn't get that far, right? So this is where I'm a big fan of the service like uh, Prove, which used to be Payphone, Roger Desai. Uh, th there's lots of good things that are being done in other countries around telecom data to prove identity. Um, some people you know, have very strong opinions about that. I, I tend to find that it worked super well in other countries. Um, for some reason, it hasn't been as successful in the US uh, around using telecom data. So awesome. Uh, then the next question, what's your take on the UPI gateway in India and yeah. its use case in the current scenario, which you mentioned, you know, considering yeah. cost scalability? Yeah. So I'm I'm super bullish on UPI. Um, I had a chance to work on it once upon a time. Um, Ultimately, I didn't implement it. Someone else did that I was working with, and I was super jealous because UPI is one of the most successful, you know, payment standards ever of all time. Um, and so, so I think uh, a central bank that um, like really understands payment schemes, like I think that's what it made UPI so successful is they helped the help they helped the banks get out of their own ways in. in two ways. One is they provided a public scheme that uh, as long as you're tied to a bank account, anyone can adopt that scheme, implement that scheme, use that scheme, right? That's a big deal. Uh, access and you know standardization is a, is a massive deal for a free flow of capital. The second thing they did is they solved the authentication problem, which is also a massive deal. So I wrote a blog on my LinkedIn that like no one read because who cares about RTP. RTP is the clearinghouse standard for real-time payments. And I said, RTP is not a standard, it's a protocol. Like if you know what you're doing when it comes to money facilitation and you solve authentication, RTP is great. But most financial institutions um, are going to struggle with that authentication problem because they're going to all attack it in different ways, right? And what UPI said is, no, we're all going to do it this way, which really helped everyone adopt the standard, right? And that that adoption is what creates scale. That scale is what lowers costs. I love UPI. It's the same thing I love about PIX. Like if you go work in Brazil on TED, it's real time. Money's moving across banks in real time. It's it's a lot more easier for folks who are saying, we want to we want to attack this use case. I need a standard and a way to authenticate that user. Many central banks in the in around the world are are like trying to catch up to what UPI and PIX has, has done. Hopefully that answers your question. It's, it's a really good question. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, and so just opening this up, can closed loop payments be cross border? Um, so this is a tricky question. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I've worked with a lot of lawyers. So I'll, I will say this with a caveat of saying, check with your, check with a lawyer first. Here's what I'll say. 
there are certain financial institutions that are uh, global by nature. Therefore, they're able to, uh, you know, take hold of funds. Uh, I like to think of like City WorldLink as being a phenomenal example. DBS in Southeast Asia, JP Morgan. At the end of the day, if they have an entity that is within their remit of uh, that country's laws and regulations, there is no reason they can't facilitate money between consumers they bank in that country and businesses they bank in that country. The challenge you will run into is historically financial institutions have not thought of it in those ways, meaning each instrument, whether it's ACH or it's cards or it's wires, has its own services. It has its own dedicated team. Therefore, it has its own rules, its own audit, and its own compliance practices. When you say, hey, I want to start facilitating money movement between these two countries inside the bounds of the bank, those teams would look at it. And my experience has been, they will go, why? Let them go back to how we do it today. The tried and true methods help share the risk. If it's all inside the bank, the bank takes on that risk. Do we want it? Do, do, are we convinced we can really mitigate that risk with our own controls and teams, right? So the answer is, can you do cross-border closed loop? Yes. Are you going to find a bank partner that will help you do that? Tricky. Um, because uh, the infrastructure to support kind of all the programmatic services you need in place to make the to make those solutions kind of seamless for the end user very challenging right you've got to work state by state country by country break down the laws build out all the flows like that that can be very challenging time consuming but it's not impossible like it, it can definitely be done why not just offer uh maybe do let's say an ACH you know payment bank transfer or or even yes. wire yes so Wires are terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, if you've ever either sent or been the recipient of, you'll know what I'm talking about because there's no statusing, there's no messaging. Now, of course, GPI um, from Swift is taking, kind of taking a step forward to do kind of more messaging flows through the life cycle of a wire in correspondent banking. It still has to go through an adoption kind of curve for all the financial institutions kind of jumping onto GPI. Um, so the answer is wire is both costly and it's not uh, effective in so far as, um, you know, did the payment actually arrive? Did like, do I have a high degree of certainty? Am it, like, or am I chasing? Like, how do I get those funds back if they get lost? Wire has great use cases, but not, not in a kind of very transactional, low dollar, high volume kind of model that we're describing. So ACH, I would agree with you. So, so this is an interesting discussion because there have been several ACH wa like wallets in market that I think very highly of. Aeropay, I'll just say in, in the cannabis space, very successful ACH wallet. From a merchant perspective, the challenges with ACH is all around risk. There are rules in NACHA today that allow you as a consumer to go pull your funds back within a 60-day window. In a stored value model, if you go read Starbucks terms and conditions, McDonald's terms and conditions, Chick-fil-A terms and conditions, when you add funds to that stored value, you are pre-buying goods. It's a really interesting concept. As a user, uh, every time I put money on that Starbucks gift card, that money's gone. Like I'm not, I, I can go challenge that, that $20, $50, $80 transaction I topped up on Starbucks. The bank will look at the hundreds of transactions I did before and go, why are you challenging this one, right? From a Starbucks perspective, the risk has gone way down because once those goods are pre-bought, I can count those as funds held. They just haven't been redeemed yet for goods and services. So they're not technically revenue yet, but they are uh, part of my balance sheet. It's a really interesting shift. And it's why, you know, uh, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's why, uh, how do I say this? Um, the, the ACH wallets will be challenged. Uh, they will always have that risk of consumers playing the chargeback game, right? And, and a stored stored value model shifts that risk. It becomes very different. Nice. Uh, another question, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I think Brazil picks... Um, what what do you think about cross-border payments, uh, the 
the picks in, in UPI for greater good. Um, what are the major, major differences between them, if any? Oh, cross-border payments, picks in UPI for greater good. Um, oh my gosh, this is a good question. So this is a tough one. Tarun, uh, here's what I will say. Both are in-country uh, money movement models, right? Meaning PIX is great because it assumes uh, Brazilians moving money inside of Brazilian infrastructure or or even non-Brazilians like moving money inside of Brazilian infrastructure. The moment you step out of Brazil and you go into other cross-border, it now becomes a question of the bank inside of Brazil and the remit they have to move those funds out. So I will say for domestic money movement, PIX and UPI, amazing all day long. When you take the cross-border side of it, it becomes a different equation. You're solving for a, a different problem, right? Which is, um, you know, uh, how am I effectively uh, taking a, a financial institution, making sure they're comfortable as a Brazilian bank moving funds outside of Brazil or, or into Brazil? So I'll just say, and it's the same thing with UPI. UPI is an amazing in-country settlement model, right? To facilitate faster payments in country. The moment you step out of that, you're working directly with whoever the financial institution is, DBS or whoever inside of India to say, hey, we're going to use UPI as the domestic collection method. We've got it. Okay, now we're ready to push it to another account I own in wherever, right? Like, that, become, that, that becomes a different use case between whoever is doing the, the domestic acquiring on the, on the UPI side and whoever is now pushing those funds outside of, of that country. Hopefully I answered that question. Nice. Um, and I just wanted to cover, just mention this. Uh, I meant to ask it before uh, and just missed it. So would transactions be faster than say, a, a debit card yes so um so in either case there's still a settlement function meaning what happens at the point of sale needs to be reported back to the uh, uh to whoever is processing the payment at the end of the day between the the user and the merchant uh today um whether it's debit or credit cards those settlement windows can take anywhere from you know as short as two or three days to as long as two weeks. Uh, in a closed loop function, it can be shortened down, arguably to real time. Uh, I think we we got as far as next day, which for what we were looking at solving, you know, cash in transit for as an example for settlement. So if you're taking cash all day long as a merchant, it takes seven to ten days to see those funds realized as revenue from you know the cash going into your terminal. Cash goes into a vault. Someone comes takes that cash counts it all, remits that wire to the bank. Bank says, boom, here's your revenue. Um, it takes seven to 10 days. So from that perspective, Valley Pay was very successful in having next day settlement compared to a seven to 10 day settlement cycle. Um, 